Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to uh, give thanks to the traditional Waka uh, this morning from the Yungra Elder Gale and the others that are here today. Um, thank you very much for the warm welcome. It's uh, such a privilege to be here. Uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge Giles, Cameron, uh, Bruno, and others who have uh, welcomed me over the last few days. And thank you to the COVID Working Group. Uh, I attended the Green Car training yesterday, which was uh, really great to see how uh, the dieback is impacting here in Australia and how you are all working together to uh, manage that uh, for the health of our forests. So, um, I'm looking forward to meeting more of you here today as well. Uh, so, yeah, my name's Tui. I was, uh, when I was born, uh, the Tui is a bird, uh, it's a forest bird, and it uh, plants the small seeds in the forest. And when I was born, uh, the Tui was going extinct. So I was named to Tui Ngarua. It's kind of like a cultural indicator. Uh, and um, it sort of put me on my path, I think, to do environmental work. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in the bush when I was young. And my father is a traditional, was a traditional medicine uh, man. And he would take me into the forest as well when I was in my 20s and teach me about um, the plant properties and uh, uh, the health benefits of the forest. And he ran a, he ran a clinic uh, with my stepmother in Whakarei, uh, which is where I live today. Uh, it's a city, um, maybe some of you may know, I'll turn on New Zealand, but Whakarei is a city in, the only city in Northland, uh, two hours north of Auckland, and uh, we're some tropical, low-land uh, forest wetland people. So I've been involved in the uh, Cody. Sorry, is that moving? Oh, it is moving. Okay. Yeah. Um, around ten years now, uh, Cody dieback was identified in Aotearoa. Uh, the Cody tree is this one back here. Sorry, this is the Cody tree uh, for Maori. Uh, it's a very significant tree. Uh, some of them. Uh, the most significant ones that are still standing are around 2,000 years old. Uh, they're very, very large girth trees and uh, we use them for ocean voyaging for our double hulled uh, canoes to voyage over to Easter Island and Hawaii and other places around the world as we have uh, for many years. And uh, so as soon as it was identified that Cody dieback was uh, impacting fatally on our Cody trees. Uh, myself and, and many other Māori uh, became engaged in the program and helped to establish the structure and the policies and processes within the program. So just as an example, these are these, this is an old map. Um, I, I acknowledge my previous speaker around you know this issue around publicly available maps in terms of uh, you know what we're monitoring and, and, and our surveillance on the ground and it's also part of my work currently is to try to ensure that the geospatial work that we're doing uh, in the program can be shared with everyone so that we can all uh, manage um, our forests. So yeah this area this is Auckland here so the Auckland Council did a lot of intensive sampling over the years and um, in the red areas are the uh, areas that the positive samples were found. And uh, Whangarei's up there with the, the red dot and the three uh, yellow dots surrounding it. Uh, and on the, the left area on the west coast there, that's Waipawa Forest, that's another really well-known uh, Cody Forest. So, uh, yeah, so I said, as I said, we were engaged in the uh, establishment of the Cody Dieback Management Program. So it's a partnership program, and it includes the Ministry of Primary Industries, uh, it includes the Department of Conservation, uh, regional councils, so there are three regional councils involved, 
and Māori. Uh, at the beginning, we were identified in the charter that established the program as one of the program partners. And so, uh, within the model, uh, there is a governance body that has representatives from each of the partners. So it has a Director General from Ministry of Primary Industries, for example, and it also has two Māori representatives that are, have been nominated to sit alongside um, and be a part of the governance program. And then within the model, within the structure of the management of the uh, program, we have operations, you know, they're doing things like tracks and cleaning stations, uh, we have planning and intelligence, which is largely focused around the research and the science. Uh, and we also have engagement and behaviour change, of course. You know, humans, we the vectors. Um, we need to support people to make good decisions when we're out there in the forest. So another important component. And so each of those three work streams, we have Māori who represent and uh, put a Māori lens on things uh, as working in the program. So I'm on the planning and intelligence uh, work stream. I'm one of three Māori who are part of that. And uh, my job is to keep an eye on the traditional knowledge components within the research that comes in. And uh, to help with the work that uh, those of us representatives do, we also have embedded some engagement policies within the Cody Dialect program. So at the beginning, because Cody is known to be such a significant treaty to Māori, uh, we carried out two cultural impact assessments. Just so we could go out and engage with communities about what would happen if Cody were to all um, no longer be around, you know, how how much would that impact on indigenous communities? So we did one uh, in-depth uh, work, cultural impact assessment was the people called Te Roroa. They're the ones that are on the west coast, what I showed with the, a lot of the, the positive um, sites. Uh, they did one around their community, and then we did a second cultural impact assessment which uh, took a broader lens over the um, entire Cody land. So Cody doesn't extend throughout the um, whole of the country. Uh, it, it ends um, a little bit south of Auckland, goes out to Coromandel. Um, so just coming into Waikato, so not quite the centre of the North Island here. Uh, we've also, uh, within the programme, established policies around free prior informed consent. So you know it was really important when we're working with knowledge that we ensure that we are working appropriately with indigenous knowledge and that we're acknowledging community owned traditional knowledge. Um, so you know that, that has a, that's been quite uh, interesting work uh, you know in terms of how we ensure that communities feel empowered to, to share how we ensure that the program respects diverse knowledge systems and um, that there are protections along the way in terms of how we do that and that public money that is being spent within the program is also showing, we're sharing the benefits of the research. And, and there, there, these are some of the discussions actually that come out, come out in terms of the, the science as well. Sometimes that's not always uh, easily distributed as well. So we've established free prior informed consent policies, uh, access and benefit sharing, some of you may know that around, you know, related to the Boyer Protocol. Uh, and um, to help with that, we work, we, did, we modelled one uh, framework with SIO, who are the, uh, they used to be the Crown Research Institute for Forests. Uh, and they wanted to do some work with Te uh, So we worked with them around triggers. You know, when you go into a, an indigenous community, you know, how do you ensure that they know that you've taken care and thought around uh, their needs and um, the way in which they like to work in their worldview? And so we help them to put together this framework around, um, you know, such things as free crime form consent, access and benefit sharing, who do they communicate with? How do they prefer to be communicated with? You know, so when they went into Te 
your word to the community, it, it, it sort of brought down the barriers that sometimes you know are in place because of you know things that have gone on in the past. That can help with the community and the scientists to really work together uh, for the benefit of the forest. And that now has become somewhat of an industry uh, best practice. It's also been embedded within SION, within the uh, Research Institute's um, normal way of working these days because um, you know everyone could see that there were really good outcomes uh, through having this, this type of build, potential for building good relationships. And through that, uh, there have been uh, further research that is now extended uh, around Cody uh, lands. One, for example, is looking at susceptibility, genetic susceptibility. So, uh, Sion went into communities and talked to them about would you be willing to support this project around resistance? And would you be willing to go into your forests and gather seed and then share that with Sion? And work together, you know, during the development of that research. And so to do that, Sion established, uh, which we supported, um, helping in the development of these biocultural community protocols. And that's just to be clear at the beginning, the expectations from both sides. So those are just uh, some of the ways in which uh, we've been establishing engagement through the program. Um, intellectual property from the beginning. So also in the Charter, uh, we had a, a section of the Charter that dealt with intellectual property. And um, just a reminder there uh, that intellectual property of indigenous peoples would remain uh, the property of uh, those peoples. Can I just out of, uh, out of interest uh, who in the room has taken part in any sorts of sort of biocultural community protocols in your research? Could you just show, give a show of hands? <coughs> okay, okay, I've got work to do. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> so, another way that we engage Māori communities, and I just want to point out as well, um, a few years back there was a study done, uh, I forget the name of the, the institute, they're quite well known in, in doing these types of studies, on the level of engagement with stakeholders and you know how, about, how much do the mountain bikers know about Cody Dieback and how much do the hikers know about Cody Dieback and how much do Māori know about Cody Dieback and it was actually found that um, of all of the stakeholders, it was Māori communities that knew the most about Cody Dieback. So um, one of those ways that not only being embedded through the program and you know, having Māori being integral part partners in the program and being engaged appropriately during the research. Uh, but also, we have carried out, we've supported gatherings throughout Māori communities to talk about, from a traditional knowledge perspective, what could be some solutions? What could be some ways in which we could carry out research that, are, that resonates with Māori and that empowers Māori to continue to have a strong bond with our with our folks and to contribute to to this you know problem this dieback. So at the first what we call wana the like gatherings of knowledgeable people, the first the first one that we held, the elders said that we wanted to use cultural indicators to carry out forest assessments and to monitor, uh, you know, the health of our forests. So, uh, the word for us, forest, is ngahere. And ngahere means, here is to like weave, weave things together. And so, the meaning of ngahere is all of the species within the forest woven together as one, not one being more important. Than the other. So we've always been reminded by the elders that, you know, that, that tiny little moss 
and that huge as 2,000 year old tree, they're all important and have, we, all, we are all have this symbiotic relationship and that our work in the program needed to continue to support that principle that we hold. So we carried out this cultural, in the, cultural health indicator um, project and so we looked at the Cody tree and it's known as a keystone species. <coughs> so there are around 120 species known to live on or very close, you know, around the Cody tree. And so we looked at all those 120 species and we thought, okay, what of those species are, are used our traditional livelihoods? Weaving, carving, medicine, proverbs, you know, some long time to compare birds to people, um, more call, you know, our, all the different types of ways in which we have a relationship, a known relationship to these species. And we came up with around 80, 80 of those species. And so our first report on cultural indicators was a, a just a, a, a book, it's a publication, it's available online, um, listing all of those species with their pictures and the ways in which they're culturally relevant to us and some suggestions around maybe how we can assess their house. Uh, and we went around and we did a lot of you know, work with elders and communities and we thought about, okay, if the Cody itself, this is another way of, of uh, health assessment, if the Cody itself could live the best life that it could, you know, and, and the longest uh, life with the, the sun and the wind and everything it needs, what would that look like? You know, and, and, and also of all these alien species, other species, what would it look like if they could live the best life that they were put on this earth to live? And we integrated those sorts of principles within the way in which we monitor. So one, one example is like shellfish. When we go out and we coast with people, when we go out and pick shellfish, you know, we want to make sure that it's there represented in all the different types of life stages. Very much in our indigenous communities. You know, when you come to my village and there's a meeting, there's a gathering at the mud eye, and you see the babies are there, and the kids are running around, and the teenagers might be peeling the potatoes in the kitchen, and the, the adults are there, and the elders are there, and you know, we're there represented through the broad range of our life stages. And now those are the, that, then we know we have a housing community. And we apply those sorts of ethics as well to our principles around the monitoring. You know, so when our uh, guardians, or um, perhaps they're similar to, your, to the rangers, which we're learning about, it sounds exciting. Um, when they are going into the forest, these are some of the things that they're looking at. Um, so, Yes, this, this, these are some of those 80 species. Oh, that's a tui. I don't know if you can really see it very well. Um, yeah, so this is a little bit, we talked about, so we developed the indicators then into, okay, we well now have got all these indicators. How do we go out and how do we monitor this, you know, from an, an, in an indigenous way? And uh, so we talked about, well, Thank you for, I, I didn't know six seasons here, that's fascinating. Um, the lunar calendar is a big thing for us back home as well. Uh, my own family go around and teach um, communities to revitalise the knowledge around um, what we call the Maramataka, the um, lunar calendar. And so, you know, every month something different goes on in the forest. Whether it's the birds nesting, or you know, I, I see now here in Perth, it's the wildflower season, so beautiful. Um, you know, at certain times there needs to be seeding. Um, certain animals are migrating back. 
you know, things that we would expect to see each month and the forest changes. And so um, the framework, the monitoring framework that we carry out is based around our lunar calendar, our knowledge around the way in which the forest changes. And so the guardians go in and they observe those changes and uh, record them using uh, GIS. So yeah, we talk a little bit about what would that monitoring team look like, what are the skills that they need. Uh, some communities um, are very knowledgeable, and then how do we include our youth? Uh, we've done some of this uh, in schools, and it lined up with the NCEA credits as well, which was great. Um, how is the site selected? You know, what's a, what's a site that's too small? Um, when a site is selected, uh, what are the vectors? You know, what's the historical management? Um, what are the pests that are there? If we're trying to look at Cody dieback, uh, the main uh, role of the indicators is to see not only susceptibility, but are the, are the indicators. So is there a, a plant that grows as the dieback comes in or as it goes? And um, we are currently piloting this in three communities. Hoping to pilot it Hoping to roll out the pilot because three communities is quite a small sample size. So we're hoping to roll out three per year um, to see, to spread uh, how, uh, what we know is happening in the forest. So this is one example of a uh, site report form. So, Tinana Oranga, so we look at the tree itself, you know, um, is it symptomatic, um, how is the trunk looking, you know, how healthy is it, and, um, you know, the sides of the, within the canopy, uh, uh, we call that Tinana Oranga, sort of your physical health, uh, and as I mentioned for Naumatanga, like, that is the life stages there, so are the seeds, you know, for Cody, um, the, we expect to see the seeds from February onwards in the, in the warm months. And uh, then our goals and goddesses. So uh, the forest, the god of the forest, uh, and now uh, well viewed, is Tani Mahuta. He is the father of humans. And um, his brothers and sisters are also very significant to us. So we develop uh, our monitoring frameworks around our gods and our goddesses. Um, so Tafi Nati and he's the wind. And um, the Kodi tree needs the wind uh, to disperse its seeds. And uh, so we make note around Tafi Nati. Tamanui Te Ra, he's the sun. Uh, so, you know, uh, trees need the sun, so there's an assessment around that. Tangaroa, Tangaroa, and, and some of these uh, are different in different communities. Tangaroa is the water, Papatua Nakushi being Earth Mother. So, what's the soil? You know, very much, very important part of the monitoring, um, being that the diving is in the soil. Okay, so that was a. Uh, are there any? I, I just. This is my last section, the medicine side of things. So, um, does anyone. We're going to have a, a section for questions at the end, but does anyone have any questions on uh, what we've talked about so far? Easy. Okay, I can carry on. So, the other side of when we have these original gatherings with our um, elders and communities. They not only see that cultural indicators uh, is an important way of managing and monitoring the dieback, but also uh, there was a strong feeling that our traditional medicine knowledge could also have some, provide some solutions to interventions, whether that's treatments or, um, you know, different ways to improve the health of the forest. 
Because as I said before, the uh, in terms of uh, looking at a forest as a Ngahere, not one species being more important than the other, we look, we've always looked at holistic forest health, not just had a uh, you know fo sole focus on the pathogen. Um, at the beginning, the program, the Cody Diabet program, mostly looked at the pathogen. Um, and around five years ago, halfway through, um, they opened, became more open to looking at forest health. So we're sort of more aligning uh, together these days. So I just wanted to acknowledge some of our elders that have been a big part of this, what we call the one that's traditional medicine. Um, you know, there's, there's very, there's not a lot of trust around Indigenous peoples back home sharing our, our medicine knowledge. So this has taken time. And uh, we started out by holding a gathering of traditional medicine people from around the country that had an interest in talking about sharing uh, ideas around potential treatments. And we held this meeting two years ago. Um, and we talked about applying sort of similarly when someone comes into a medicine clinic, you know, and you need a full health assessment uh, uh, properly, you know, done by, by the elders. And uh, so the first step would be something like a forest health assessment and uh, to look at where the gaps are potentially in, in um, the health of the forest. And then the next step, thank you, would be around uh, what, what types of interventions may that forest need. So if it's infected or not infected. Some non, not yet known to be infected sites are still unhealthy. You know, and there are other pathogens and there are other pests uh, that are impacting on the health of our forests. And so again, to take a holistic look, we're not just looking for dieback. We're looking for any types of health impacts that may be going on in our forests and how we can empower communities to respond to those impacts and improve the health. So when we had the gatherings, there were a lot of ideas that came forward about uh, potential plant properties. Uh, that could be developed into powders or heart um, <coughs> extracts that could be applied directly on the dieback, maybe some of phosphite. Um, that could be applied in the soil to improve the health of the soil or inoculate the soil. So we came up with a, a, a broad list of ways in which uh, we could respond from a traditional medicine uh, perspective. And some, and we took that a, a, a step further as well. We talked about um, duration of application. Uh, you know, these are quite, quite uh, a new. This has never been done before, I must say. Um, so we wanted to ensure that we're following uh, indig our indigenous principles while also ensuring that the research. Uh, stacks up in a robust way. Uh, so the next steps, the next steps, that are to look at these interventions, whether they boost in forest immunity, uh, you know, so that, so that the tree can be as healthy as it can be uh, if the dieback comes in and uh, look at the remedial and physical interventions and uh, also around our spiritual ways of responding and you know we have my own community in Ngāti uh, we have a 50,000 hectare catchment with the majority landowners within our catchment and um, our mother tongue is the still the first language spoken uh, our schools are taught in our mother tongue still and so we have a lot of, we still have a lot of cultural continuity uh, within my community, and we uh, do not have dieback as far as we know in our community. As soon as we knew about it, we actually established some controls around hunters coming in, and, you know, things like that. And 
And our community believe very strongly that we don't have dieback because of the prayers that we carried out, the strength of our prayers. And so being that, this is a traditional medicine uh, research project. We include uh, the spiritual side of things as well. This might be my last slide, I think. Uh, so the stage that we're at now is to consider uh, recipes. So say we have, you know, there's, there's, there's a big recommendation around this oil. It's known to be antifungal, have these antifungal type properties. Uh, what would be the recipe, you know? When it comes to medicine, sometimes it's where in that deep forest at what time of night did you pick that medicine and take it back and then what, how did you mix it? Did you dry it? Did you boil it? Um, the prayers, again, that you see the incantations and the way in which it was applied to the person or the tree or forest, all of that is a part of the potency of uh, the healing properties. So the stage that we're at now is to develop that well, kind of recipe, that's what we're calling it. Uh, and we're looking at pilot communities. So to do these interventions, where will we do them in the forest? Um, you know, what will the site look like? And uh, is it pest free? Uh, you know, we need to do a cultural indicator assessment, beginning, during, after, that type of thing, to see the changes uh, that we may be making. And the best part, um, because I've been project managing the indicator project and the traditional medicine, the best part of it that I've seen in this very short time is empowerment of communities to take part in the decision making to improve the health of their forests and in many ways reconnecting and strengthening that connection um, between communities and their forests, which also gives them more confidence to work with people like you to work with everyone that has a passion for improving the health of our, of our forest. So that's, I think that's plenty this morning. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now, or, um, or we can talk later on in the day if you feel more comfortable. Kia ora. Questions, who's got a question first for the wonderful kind of, um, encapsulation there of all the cultural approach to managing cubby design, uh, decline. Up the back, Ingrid's got one. Thank you, that was a really great presentation. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you <coughs> engaged with the, um, the National Park Agency and how open they were to your ideas and how you overcame some of the barriers that you might have faced. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so the national parks back home are managed by the Department of Conservation. Uh, essentially within Cody Lands we don't have any national parks, but we do have some yeah, de Department of Conservation administered <coughs> lands. Uh, they have within their act, uh, within the Conservation Act, Section 4, um, clause in there around giving effect to the Treaty of Waitangi. So it's quite a strong, uh, we believe, as Indigenous Peoples, um, law for them to ensure um, partnership arrangements, co-management, things like that, and within the Charter as well, because they're a partner to the programme. So there's quite compelling political uh, reminders for them to work with us. In terms of on the ground, um, they've most, Doc, Doc has been very active in tracks, track maintenance. So, um, you know, before the program, there were no boardwalk, not as many boardwalk type tracks as there, there are now, and uh, cleaning stations, uh, things like that. Uh, one of the pilot communities that I'm working with on the cultural indicator 
program. They have just repatriated land from the Department of Conservation. It's a 600 hectare block. Um, so we work with the Department of Conservation around the historical management of that site. Like it's really, there's a lot of possums and deer in there. And um, just, you know, in terms of uh, empowering communities to now, you know, work into the future, knowing what has happened there. And there's a couple of mapping tools that they, that Doc use uh, with their pest control um, trackers that we have been able to utilise <coughs> as well. But it's very much, very much community initiated. You know, um, it's not like Doc has laid out all the tools and, you know, and, and initiated this sort of thing. It's very much ground up at the moment. And, and yeah, I think um, we could all do a little bit better. Okay, I reckon we'll stick to time. Big round of applause.